Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Montgomery, and this session is Understanding Azure Service Fabric. It's the first part in iDesign's webcast series on the Azure Service Fabric. Before we begin, just a little bit about me. I'm a master architect at iDesign, and uh, in that capacity, I help our clients conceive, design, and build modern microservice-based systems. I've uh, had the luck of being able to assist dozens of clients in putting systems into production using iDesign techniques. And uh, other, another aspect of note, I've been delivering distributed systems for uh, over 15 years now, and I've, more than one of them, I've owned the full life cycle. And so that's very relevant to this discussion today because I know the challenges that you all face um, delivering successfully all uh, these distributed systems. And I also uh, have experienced firsthand the pain as well. Today, I'm going to clarify for you uh, the value proposition of the fabric. We're going to talk briefly about what the fabric is. And then we're going to explore a little bit its origins because its origins are very relevant to what you're all experiencing right now, trying to build modern software systems. And then we'll dive more deeply into why this particular technology is so important. And then along the way, we're going to touch on basic concepts, give you some foundational uh, introduction to the way the fabric works. And then finally, Equally important, we're going to introduce to you how you can actually prepare for it today. So in a nutshell, the fabric is basically Azure infrastructure made public. It's what Microsoft is calling Azure Pass 2.0. It's very mature. There's already major pieces of Azure built on top of it. Many existing ones cleaned up. And of course, it's been born of the cloud so that it actually supports the future needs. This is just a small list of some of the things that are actually built on top of the fabric today. Azure SQL, the bus, event hubs. You think of something as large as Azure SQL built on top of the fabric. Now you're talking about something, uh, mature technology that's supporting 100K plus instances of SQL databases. And as they roll out past 2.0, you know, soon everything will be built on top of it. Let's get into the origin of the fabric. Microsoft had a problem. How to stay nimble while developing and deploying at cloud scale these modern distributed systems. There's numerous concerns surrounding that. How to codify the service programming model. How to improve their agility across the whole entire pipeline. How to streamline the SDLC. And most importantly, which we'll talk about uh, at length in this particular session, their needs for mending the schism between what the developers are building and then the operational capabilities for actually deploying that software. And finally, we'll touch briefly on how they also wanted this platform to align with future trends. The key thing here is that their problems are now all of our problems. All of you are experiencing these same concerns. What we believe is happening is that the industry is at a major inflection point. Expectations formerly reserved for the largest of systems are now falling in the laps of the smallest of teams, and I'm sure all of you can sympathize with that experience. Capabilities that were formerly for big, large systems like elasticity, reliability, parallelism, modularization, hybrid scenarios, the list just goes on and on. Now, as the smaller teams are all having to deliver on these expectations that the business have for these modern systems. So the very reason in the origin, the necessity that Microsoft found for building the service fabric is the same concerns that we all have now. In response to all this, the Azure team realized that they needed to build an integrated service platform. 
one that binds both dev and ops together with a single service-oriented system structure. They needed to be able to build in reliability and, and elasticity and have it be compatible with emerging trends, meaning, of course, that it would support this new notion of what we call microservices, as well as trends leading further into the future, as we'll, we'll touch on. The platform also needed to be a technology abstraction layer. It needed to support multiple environments, such as a, a simple dev deployment or even on-premises. It needed to potentially even support multiple operating systems and programming languages. And they needed to bring, to start to bring consistency to a varied technology landscape. So you can now lay the fabric, of course, in Azure, both over Windows and Linux, but you can also deploy it into other hosted cloud environments. Again, leveraging either operating system. And equally important then for a lot of us in the beginning, the on-premises experience in your own DC, either over Linux or Windows. They also needed to respond to the demise of Moore's Law. We can't move forward simply by throwing hardware at the problem. We've lost that crutch. Now we need to be able to support new models of parallelism. That's the only way to scale and get faster. All of you understand that distributed systems are hard to deliver successfully and maintain over time. Distributed parallelism is even harder. So to mitigate that concern, we have to have a platform that is built to support it with the appropriate programming paradigms that make it easier to reason about these new modes of parallelism. Out of that comes this notion that the industry is really developing called actors. It's a very old pattern, but it's very relevant today with the loss of Moore's Law. For this particular session, we'll just consider an actor a very granular, simple programming construct. In future webcasts, we will dive deep into all aspects of actors, including their architectural capabilities and what we can potentially do moving forward to solve some of these concerns of parallelism and scale. But for now, just consider it that they are very small, they're also stateful, and that we actually network them together to produce broader parallel behaviors. And in the future, we'll be using new patterns such as grids, meshes, and graphs to compose large groups of actors into new parallel solutions. Almost most importantly, the Azure Service Fabric delivers on the historical mandate for service orientation. Your iDesign founder, Yuval Lowy, has observed that Every 14 years or so, our industry goes through major eras, and within those eras, there are phases that we walk through the development tools and technology as we go from one epoch to the next. The first phase is methodology, where we are building the vNext programming constructs on the current technology. We can solve the new problem, but very painstakingly, and there's no standards. Out of the methodology phase comes the technology phase, where a technology emerges that addresses the new problems directly, and there begin to start to introduce some clear productivity gains because we write less code, we can get more done, we are focused on or using a technology that's more focused specifically on the problem at hand. But in the technology phase, there are rarely conventions that truly uh, simplify the programming experience. And that's what emerges in the platform phase. Implicit technology use, exponential product productivity gains because you are no longer building plumbing. You are now truly focused more on the business value. And there's also codified integration of the concepts involved. And we can walk through this historical mandate from assembly language to C, from C to C++, and now from C++ to COM, 
and calm to service orientation. We have finally arrived uh, at the platform stage with the advent of the Azure Service Fabric. And if we walk through for service orientation, we can see that back in 2002, 2003, we had ASMX and WYSI, which is Web Service uh, Enhancements or Extensions. Out of that came a more, more centralized uh, uh, technology, WCF in 2007. And then finally, the Fabric, which implicitly uses these similar techniques and technologies, but it's pushed down a layer so that the programming experience is much simplified along with other aspects as we'll see. Now, there is significant value in recognizing the historical mandate. That's why we're, we're exploring the origins of the fabric. Because if you can align with it now, you can give your systems a longer lifespan. It's effectively, from the business perspective, protects the investment uh, of your software assets and promotes uh, emerging best practices and eases the transfer of your code and your systems to vNext. Part of this is also getting ready for the new era that's just emerging, actors, as we mentioned, and new models of parallelism. Now, what we can do is we can take a look at the service fabric and see if it actually does deliver on this historical mandate. To do so, it has to solve the problems of the past, it has to then implicitly integrate relevant technologies, and it has to provide clear productivity increases based on what you're doing today. So let's take a look first at what we're doing from an operational perspective. Developers are new to building systems, often have a complete disregard for the operational necessities for actually managing, deploying, and owning that system over time. So what they're building is not in, um, in concert with, with the way that you have to actually deploy it. That includes the constraints from an operational perspective, capabilities, other opportunities, and what, what we see mostly in organizations was a complete operational chaos basically development throwing the system over the wall to operations and operations trying to understand how to actually deploy and manage the system. What we've seen recently though is to compensate for this, IT has basically led a revolution and instigated what we now call DevOps. I think most organizations are starting to uh, adopt this approach where development has a first-hand experience with the operational requirements. However, out of this, though, there is no off-the-shelf plumbing for the delivery pipeline for DevOps. So everyone is left to cobble together multiple technologies. And as I think most of you have experienced, there's a huge hidden investment and a huge hidden time sink for maintaining these pipelines. It helps move the bits into the environment better, but there is a clear cost and investment in building such a pipeline. The other problem that we have with these pipelines is that, unfortunately, they're just not adequate for the needs of the modern systems. They are overly generalized, and they don't know anything about services, which means that the pipeline itself can't enforce any kind of notion of a common system structure nor can they provide uh, and inform development on architecture, on, develop, on how to construct and uh, compose the system, or even for how to deploy it. And I just want to take a moment um, relevant to this particular discussion, because this is becoming a very hot topic in the industry, and I believe it's somewhat of an anti-pattern, is that container technology is not microservices. It does not inform you at all of a proper system structure or what should go in the container. It's simply a, a way of gaining greater control and consistency over the deployment of application uh, and its dependencies, but it's not a microservice uh, in of itself. And I'm hearing a lot now in the industry, contrary to that, 
where um, developers and organizations are starting to consider that their container technology will solve their Microsoft microservice problem, and that's not true at all. In contrast, the Azure Service Fabric actually introduces consistency and standardization across the pipeline. Basically, you can look at the Azure Service Fabric as off-the-shelf DevOps uh, plumbing, which is incredible. We don't, no one has that yet. It's all piecemeal, cobbled together, very expensive to build and maintain. It also <clears throat> codifies this whole thing across the architecture, development, deployment, and administration of your systems. How it does that is by creating a modern service-oriented operations infrastructure that understands services. In this pipeline, services are a first-class citizen. They are not an afterthought. They are part of the actual pipeline. The operational infrastructure within the service fabric abides by a common system structure. And this will be a theme throughout this session, that that's the central keystone that ties this whole thing together, is a common system structure. In this operational infrastructure, it prescribes a lot of what previously you had to make independent decisions over. Topology, the day-to-day -day operations flow, lifecycle management for your systems, and tooling, and everything else. This is just a partial list of what it automates. If you really want uh, a first-class pipeline, it should really do almost everything in a best practice informed sequence that you would otherwise have to build into your pipeline by hand. Everything's here that you would expect automatically. I just want to call out quickly two things that almost everyone's SDLC misses, and that's upgrading and equally important to actually building and deploying the system, decommissioning it. So these are, again, formal aspects of the flow and upgrading even more powerful in that the fabric will upgrade your system, maintaining certain thresholds so that you can maintain availability and ensure um, accessibility during the hot upgrade, which I think is incredibly powerful capability. Let's look at the platform a little bit. We'll dive a little bit deeper into the basics. As you would expect for it to be scalable, available, and reliable, the service fabric is a cluster-based topology. Nodes are machines, most often VMs. That all makes sense. The cluster is dynamic, however. You can add and remove nodes. And in response to that, it will automatically, it will do its best, at least, to automatically rebalance the load. Creating a cluster is fairly straightforward. There is a very simple cluster configuration when you're in a certain environment like Azure that um, cluster configuration is scripted in the form of a wizard. When you're in the on-premises experience, that's a little more manual, but there are templates for this that make it very simple. All you really have to do is to find the machines that are going to be included in your configuration, uh, accept all the rest of the default uh, settings, and then the service fabric um, tooling will automatically deploy the fabric onto each node. It promotes each of these machines then into a fabric node, and then once they are, the services are installed, they will connect and communicate with each other. So as just a simple example to visualize what happens when you create a cluster, we have a set of machines. We've defined our simple configuration to include these machines. We run the installation plot, the creation uh, for the cluster, and it will install the service services onto each of the machines. And then once they're installed, they will begin to connect with each other and form the fabric uh, across those machines, and they'll be aware of each other from that point on. It's important to note that the fabric itself, the services that comprise the fabric, are built on top of the foundation of the fabric. And we'll see that shortly uh, when we take a look at a simple screenshot of 
the Explorer that allows you to visualize what's going on in your in your cluster. There's a system portion that actually um, is comprised of services that leverage the same kind of capabilities that your services will be comprised of. The cluster, of course, gives this redundancy and replication, self-healing, availability, responsiveness, all those things that you would want from this type of system, ensuring the reliability. And so, what, as you would expect, if one of the nodes goes away, the cluster is aware of it, it can reroute then the requests, service requests, to the appropriate uh, available nodes, and then when the node comes back, either the existing one or a new one, they'll reconnect with it and include it back into the uh, cluster. Likewise, if you have state uh, involved with your services, it will take that replicated state and in the background replicate it over to the new node and then include that node in the reliability structure for your services. As much as possible, the, the fabric mechanisms will try to strive for efficient node usage. There will be automatic service instant placement based on what's going on in the, in the cluster, and it does its best to try to balance the workload across the available nodes. And as you would expect, you know, the heuristics are often based on uh, resource metrics for the given machines and the capabilities involved. What this does, though, it really encourages what's an, somewhat of a new notion. Those of you who are familiar with building these types of systems are already familiar with this, this notion of density. The idea there is that for a given set of metal, you want to be able to uh, maximize that investment by getting as many services onto those machines as possible uh, within reason of being still being uh, satisfying a certain level of, of responsiveness. And this allows you then to redu reduce from a, from a hard cost perspective the total cost of ownership of, of your cluster, and it also maximizes its use. Now, there's a, as you would expect from a mature cluster, there's things you want. You want to be able to see into the cluster. And so the fabric itself is fully instrumented. It also has multiple API support, and there's automated health monitoring, the things exactly you would expect to be able to see into the platform, get the health from the platform, as well as uh, view what's going on within your cluster. So this is a simple screenshot of the Service Fabric Explorer. This is the dashboard. That's the central view, high-level uh, insight into what's going on within your cluster, how many applications and services you have running, how many nodes are within your cluster, the health of each one of those. And then as you can see at the top, there's you can drill in uh, into greater detail within each one of these. And so this is a kind of uh, an example of drilling into one of the services, seeing certain aspects about its capabilities, and then you can dive even further into that to see specific aspects and, and note uh, health events and things like that. You would also want rich tooling support, and the platform uh, provides that as well. And it also provides multiple aspects of tooling so that it speaks to both the operational side and the developer side. So for your PowerShell um, gurus, you can fully manage and orchestrate aspects of the platform through scripts. You could also build your own tools on top of the platform, leveraging existing uh, fully capable SDK in C Sharp or REST APIs. And then, of course, as you would expect, you want the tooling integrated so that it's integrated into, from a management perspective, into the Azure portal, and that provides you this rich, wizarded, and in, uh, insight into the management of your cluster within the Azure environment. Um, one important note there 
currently the ownership of a cluster within Azure is still an in, uh, infrastructure as a service experience. That means that you are still required to provide operating system updates and those kind of things to the machines in your cluster. They are actively working on and just starting to roll out support for automating those experiences. And as the platform matures, it will evolve into uh, a full Azure service. For the developers, we've got deep Visual Studio integration. And just to show that briefly, you can add a new Explorer into Visual Studio 2015 and 2017 Cloud Explorer that gives you insight into all of the assets that are in your subscription. Likewise, from the, for the day-to-day, -day, directly in the Solution Explorer, in the context menu, you can control the packaging of your application as well as publishing. And publishing is really powerful because it's a singular experience for either publishing into your local development cluster into your on-premises cluster or into your cloud cluster. So we've already taken a look at how the service fabric addresses the aspects of bringing development and operations closer together to deliver on the historical mandate. But that alone isn't enough. To really deliver on the other aspects of the mandate, it also has to address the architectural and programming model concerns. So let's see how it does that. Currently, we're all experiencing to some greater degree inconsistencies and in competing design and implementation approaches to building modern systems. This means that the developers then must absorb and understand potentially multiple architectures and even competing system structures within their own organization. There's usually gaps in architectural leadership and e where junior teams are often left to fend for themselves, and that all adds up to eroding consistency across the whole entire portfolio uh, of the systems or products that your organization produces. We've also observed that this, because there is no consistency, it introduces many internal integration issues between the aspects of the system, whether it's from the website to the microservices, from the API to the microservices, or any integration point in between. Oftentimes, what surprises me is that these internal integration points are worse than the external integration uh, that the system actually has. So we have to absolutely solve that problem. Most teams are struggling with different hosting models, security structures, concurrency, instancing, transactions, those, all those different aspects. Um, they have to, from as system to system or within the same system, may be different. The fabric, on the other hand, introduces this common system structure, which represents both the unit of deployment and contains within it the unit of scale. This promotes incredible significant degree of consistency and repeatability across the teams. This also avoids many of the common internal in integration problems that you experience as you're building out these systems because things are more consistent and repeatable within the code base. All of that adds up to promoting reuse across your microservices. And because there is a common system structure, it encourages better system design. It won't enforce it, of course, because that's your responsibility, but it will at least encourage it because it's doing a design reduction over all the possible uh, options and getting you something closer that you can, uh, to consistency that you can reason about. Let's take a quick look at the system structure. At the root of the system structure is a concept called the application. The application delineates a logical boundary around within the cluster of a collection of one or more services. You now, of course, that are hopefully logically related. It is the application that is the unit of deployment. It is what you publish. And an application may also contain, in addition to the services that represent your microservices, a website and or a web API. 
So if we were to visualize the logical boundaries for a set of applications within a cluster, it would look something like this. The blue boxes represent the logical boundary within which services are associated to those given applications, and each application can have its own set of services, and you can put multiple applications within a given cluster. As you would expect, from the logical construct of your system, the service fabric will then take your services and your applications and automatically deploy them uh, across the nodes in your cluster. Each service ideally is, is hosted in a separate uh, either process or container, and the fabric uses your configuration to determine the service placement. Uh, there's simple configuration that determines that, and there is more advanced capabilities for constraining placement to certain nodes and uh, certain uh, machine sets. If we were to take a look at an example configuration for, say, application one, and we want service 1A to deploy to all nodes, service 1B to deploy to only two nodes, and service 1C and 1N to deploy to only one node, the fabric may take that configuration and lay them across the physical um, nodes within the cluster, something like this. And it's important to note that the service boundary is then the unit of scale. So we've asked the fabric to have an instance of service 1A across every node. So then that increases our reliability and availability of that service as requests come in. And we've constrained certain other services that may have a variety of um, dependencies or, or other restrictions to only certain, uh, to a singular uh, instance. This one note about the system structure, for the majority of systems, the application uh, designation we believe is a misnomer. I think it, for a cloud-based cluster, it makes perfect sense where each application may be a tenant. But in most scenarios, what we're really looking at from this logical boundary isn't an application in, in its totality, but more of a subsystem that is composed of logically related services, all of which manage a cohesive, hopefully cohesive, set of logically related use cases. And what this infers is that this description fits better with the common perception currently of microservices. Now at iDesign, we don't think that there's one definition of a microservice, but that microservices are in fact more of a fractal and that there are microservices within uh, a given microservice and that the structure of microservices is governed by a simple taxonomy. Lastly, to deliver on the historical mandate, the service fabric has to address the developer day-to-day. -day. It's got to address the programming model. You cannot have, move forward efficiently with productivity gains with a wide disparity of programming models that the developers must master. It's simply not merchantable. It's not going to work long-term. They are not going to be able to master all these different ways of uh, constructing services and, and the different communications mechanisms involved. So of course, as you all know, there's multiple service models from URI-based or REST-esque to contract-based and interface-based and even raw message-based, most often used with uh, messaging infrastructures. Along with that, then we have multiple connectivity modes. Could be queuing, could be TCP, could be HTTP, HTTP, or even uh, named pipes and IPC, or it could be something custom. In contrast, the fabric introduces consistent, constrained, repeatable programming model across all the modes of service interaction. The majority of them are all interface-based, and that promotes a certain programming style that encourages uh, solid principles and uh, supports better testing techniques. 
all of this is really, again, informed by Microsoft's experiences from building Azure and building systems on top of, of the fabric. And so we all get to leverage that um, in our developer day-to-day. -day. And when you constrain your programming model into a consistent set, that just removes friction from the the day-to-day -day, uh, workflow of the devs, removes the decisions that they need to make, multiple uh, disparate programming models that they have to master, and allows them, again, to focus on their primary objective, which is their b producing business value. The other thing that this the constrained programming model does is it removes a great deal of reliance on configuration. And you'll see in future webcasts, once we take a look at the programming model, that the configuration burden is almost entirely removed. There's only a handful of knobs now that we really have to worry about. Everything else is codified. But that is truly a beautiful thing. How the fabric does this is through again, just like for the operational side, speaking now to the development side of the house, a modern service oriented programming model that understands the system structure. So on one side we have an operational, a service oriented operational infrastructure that understands services, and now we have a service oriented programming model that understands the system structure. And the two together are what truly create this seamless uh, lifecycle management and produce the productivity that the fabric uh, is required to, to um, create in order to solve and to address the historical mandate. And this is just some of the things that uh, listed on the slide that the the fabric actually codifies. Transactions, it's a simpler model, it takes care of entirely hosting, uh, many aspect-oriented aspects are taken care of for you, security is greatly simplified, discovery is built in, state management, persistence, fault management are all there, and under the covers, some of the more uh, secondary aspects, but equally important, uh, are also provided for. Now, this platform, and it was just why I was so excited to, to share this initial webcast with you guys. Again, back to the first slide about me and the fact that I have also owned large distributed systems. I know the challenges and the pain. This platform, from my experience, reduces or absolves a lot of the things that we commonly had to wrestle with. But we also know at iDesign that most of you are dealing with an existing code base. The majority will not be able to just dump what you have, particularly um, when it's doing well, and solve some of these additional problems by moving to this new platform. And so to seize this opportunity that the platform represents, we recognize that you have to be able to start preparing your code bases now for that eventual transition. And ideally, you would be able to do that outside of the service fabric without a big bang. You need to get your code slowly, uh, iteratively, into the common service fabric system structure as well as abiding by the programming model. And you ideally want to be able to do that in .NET, start creating your service fabrics in this new, or your, excuse me, your microservices uh, in this model now and deploy them to your existing environments. Knowing that most of our clients are in that, uh, in that boat uh, dealing with this scenario, and knowing that we also want to help our clients prepare for this uh, amazing new platform, we've invested in creating uh, what is nothing less than a breakthrough framework compatible and polymorphic with the Azure Service Fabric programming model, Service Model EX Service Fabric. It abides by the system structure. It allows your developers to get familiar with the existing programming model in .NET, very easy, comfortable um, programming experience while they understand the differences between the way they code today and what will be required of them in the fabric. And to really simplify the whole experience, we wanted a very easy transfer 
of that code base into the real uh, Azure Service Fabric. And as we'll see in subsequent webcasts and demos, it is simplified to the point of just being able to recompile. Recompile and publish. And, uh, and move your code from your local desktop into the Azure Fabric itself. The other important aspect, of course, with this recommendation is that it's built on existing iDesign techniques that are already very mature, and there's hundreds of systems uh, built on top of these techniques. And we've also, because it's so important moving forward, we've uh, took the time to include stateful actors in this initial uh, iteration of the fabric. Now, for you to be able to crunch and crush this learning curve, to get up on it faster, I am very excited to announce iDesign's Service Fabric Masterclass. Similar to the WCF Masterclass, which allowed hundreds of architects and developers to reduce the learning curve of WCF, the Service Fabric will do the same thing, the Service Fabric Masterclass will do the same thing for the fabric. Dozens of demos, hands-on labs, first-hand programming within the fabric, master, uh, help you master the programming model, understand the key concepts. The class will move from the basics into very advanced techniques like stateful services and other uh, partitioning and, and replication concepts. And it will also uh, strengthen the value proposition that the whole entire fabric represents. All those concerns that we discussed earlier in the session, it will really uh, lay a foundation of, of understanding that value proposition. We encourage you, though, to act fast. The first class sold out before it was even announced. This is the formal announcement of the class. We have added a second one now in response to the first one selling out. It is in, uh, it's on October 9th. And uh, so we encourage you to move quickly because there's a clear need for this class uh, from the community uh, as uh, of alumni as well as the industry at large. Just a couple more resource, resources really quick. Uh, had the privilege of working with Yuval on the fourth edition of Programming WCF Services, and we were able to include an essential chapter 11 on Azure Service Fabric, so that's a good an introductory reference. As well as all the other uh, serviceware that we have available on the website under the download section, you can actually go and pull the Service Fabric today, um, along with a number of samples and examples and uh, you can start to explore that program, programming model now. And so with that, I, I thank you for your attention, and uh, I really look forward to answering some of your questions.